a three-part series on Student Manager 8. This is our 101 basic series. And as always, Chuck, are you ready to go? I'm ready to go. We've got, Lori's got a full plate for us here. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. I had an issue with my drawing tools, Lori, so we're not going to, my pointer, can you see my mouse move on your screens? I can. All right, so we'll use my mouse. I had a glitch with GoToMeeting. I didn't want to take a chance. So we're going to, we always talk about what's the most important part of the system. Well, yes, last week we talked about names and how critical they are, but certainly the other part is the course. This is the product. This is what your people buy. They pay you money for is the information you put into that course. So again, our goal here is to help you understand uh, what the process involves, and we'll go through and build a course for today's webinar. Lori, how about that? And uh, we'll, we'll work through that. So um, I'm going to go ahead, and right before we start, if for those of you that have not seen the SM8 preview, one of the coolest things in this process, I love it, waited for forever for, is what's called the Favorite Reports button. And it's right in the middle of your new um, tool set. And you can pick 10, up to 10 different favorite reports and basically set them up, kind of predefined the area, the report category, default or predefined, predefined a query. You can actually now even view the notes on that report, hit Run and Kachinga you have your report. So again, wonderful tool. It's something even a boss can handle. And again, I'm, I'm saying that. So uh, for any bosses out there, I apologize. So course screen basics. All right, let's take a look at the base elements of the course. When you create a new course, the only fields required really are the course code and the title. You really can build one out for that um, as a base and then come back to it later, save it, and come back and work on it later. Uh, we'll talk about the options under type and how those might work. Um, again, we'll cover this later, but generally, most of the time, you're only creating a course from scratch, that is, with a completely blank uh, course form, if you are building out a brand new course, if you would a virgin class. Because if you've got classes you have offered before and you're doing another section or you're doing an annual program and doing it the next year, we would really recommend that you use the clone feature, which again, we'll cover in this, in this approach. Um, in terms of looking at the group, Lori, I'm going to let you be my eyes if we have any really newbies or if we've got some senior users out there and, and uh, what our mix is, as I'll let you review and I'll give a breath and let you Tell me who, 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 you know, what our mix is. Um, well, we've got some very familiar names and then some that are somewhere in the middle and just one or two that don't look familiar. Okay, a few newbies. So I'll kind of move along here and, uh, again, try to make sure we cover because, of course, uh, we are recording this for later viewing, uh, especially for new users. <clears throat> oh, fields on the core screen, category versus type. Now, again, Category is a user-defined one. It's your uh, way to uh, group together classes by a group or category. Um, we have some examples in that. When you receive the program, you absolutely can change those. So we talk about the plus button. That means you can edit the codes behind that. Open is something that is, or the type of class, that is a system setting. And again, uh, there are different behaviors that happen when you change the type of class. And so the types that we have, independent study, this gives you a, the, a way to build a class that lets you track lessons. Inventory class, it's a way for you to track sales if you wanted to have a class for book sales or a class for t-shirts. You can have people put that on the line and let people buy that independently. Online classes, if it's an online open enrollment asynchronous class where dates aren't really a big deal, uh, gives you some special features. Membership class, again, for OSHA programs or programs that have classes that are membership-based, it allows you to set up the course that you're on 
as a way to record memberships and assign a membership code and an expiration date to people who pay the membership. Open class. This is, if you would, the normal or regular. You may set a preference on what is your default type. Pending. Uh, now back to that said we could put in just a course number and a course title and, and actually save the course. Uh, sometimes if you're working up of the design of a program, uh, you're a program manager and you're thinking about building out a class but you don't have the details, you can create a class, give it a title, give it a code, call it pending, and then go in and set up the details on it. Build out a budget, uh, work up maybe your description, and then once it once you've kind of gotten all your editing done, you can switch the status from pending to open, or whatever it falls under. A workshop class allows tracking of sub-events. Uh, I'm just curious and make people wake up here. Raise your hand, kids, if you are doing workshop classes. Give me a show of hands. Uh, how many people are doing workshops? In Michelle is in there doing them. Judy, yep, I would have thought Georgia Southern. All right, we've got a few. And again, if you, uh, for those of you that don't know what that is, it basically primary category use is where you have breakout sessions or tracks of learning inside a particular course, class, workshop, conference. So conferences would use that a lot. Uh, kids camps. If you have a kids camp with a week long of events and kids can sign up at 8 o'clock for archery, at 9 o'clock for pottery, at 10 o'clock for outdoor adventure, and you want to know which, which activity kids are going into for every hour, that's workshops. Um, I believe that's a module. I think we've got a module on that in the webinar archive. Contract course, again, gives you a way to categorize your course for a contract program. That's an in-house program, typically a private program for a particular company uh, for those that do business-to-business -business private training. Workforce particular event program. Uh, for ACEWEB, for student manager, you can always add a multiple seat purchase. We'll talk about that in registration. But on ACEWEB, calling a class or defining a class as an event would allow you to let students purchase multiple tickets, if you would, to a class. And what that typically falls into are things like a reception or a gala celebration where you're selling a $10 ticket to a wine and cheese social hoo-ha, hoo-ha. And all you just need to know is how many bodies are going to come. So you can put up an event class and a student can go in and register and say, I want 20 tickets. You multiply out the purchase, or it could be free, I think. I'm, I haven't tried a free one, Lori. Uh, but to track a head count uh, for a, a more of an open access activity. All right. Donation. Again, in the student manager back office registration entry, you can manage accepting payments about any way you want. On ACEWEB, however, what it allows you to do is set up a class in your ACEWEB uh, that a individual can actually write in the amount of money they want to donate and then pay for that with a credit card. So it basically allows for you don't have to set uh, categories of fees for a donation. They can put in either one or one with a lot of zeros behind it, hopefully. Okay, optional module, package one, package two. These are an optional, these, they, they are part of the BOGO uh, packaging optional module and is a great tool for bundling classes together. Uh, there is a webinar on that. So, okay, Lori, dare I take a breather and ask if there's questions or everybody is hanging on, paying attention? Well, I was watching the hand raise, so let's go back and look for questions. All right. Um, does pending keep the course from showing in the registration selection list? Yes. Pending course, by default, makes it inactive and uh, so that you can't register for it. All righty. That's our only burning question. All right. Well, we'll move on. Uh, active. This is one that generally always creates a bunch of discussion, but uh, the big deal about active is for 
student manager users, the back office, I should say student manager, the people in the back office who use student manager to do registration. In order to see a class to register, when you're in a name and you want to do ad registration, a class must be active. Now the flip of this is, when that class is no longer open for registration, you need to deactivate it. And that is a manual process. We do not automatically deactivate courses inside the student manager, your admin back office side. And again, so that as a class is finished uh, and, and it's closed, nobody else can register. Or again, if you're building classes for next January already, or next fall, but you don't want them showing up in the registration sequence for your end of summer registrations, you make them inactive. And again, I'll reiterate, uh, active in, uh, yeah, again, if you regularly deactivate, your staff will love you. It speeds up registration a huge amount. Um, and I think the mass change option, there is a tool to do this under the course screen. And I'm going to actually flip to the desktop because I want to show this live. Um, your student manager now will be the new student manager 8 is now purple, so we have a distinctive look to it. Sign on is the same. Student callbacks, reminder notes, and the email course reminder. We'll cover this again, but this is part of the automatic send a reminder email feature to students in upcoming classes that you can define brings up a, a mail merge personal email that you'd hit fire away. Everybody in a class that meets in that time frame would get a private email. All right, so we're back at the main system. I wanted to go to that tool that deactivates courses. Courses, mass change, update, delete is where you can say change the active status to inactive and you're going to typically do it where the begin date or the end date is between a range of dates. So if you're saying it's now the 20th of May, we're not going to register any new people in any classes that started between the first of the year and the 20th. So we're going to say a 101, 14 through 05, 21. And you'll note I'm going to tab out of the date field it automatically puts in today's or the year. So for date entry, if you just type the last two digits of the year, 1, 4, it will fill out the current year or just leave it blank. I'm going to delete that. I'm just going to tab. It fills out the year. I didn't know that until just this last year. All right, let's run it. Change the active status, and you've automatically updated the active status. And again. You say, well, what if I did it wrong and I need to reactivate? Not a problem. You can always go back to the course and turn the active button back on. All right, we good on that, Lori? Uh, everybody? I believe so. Funny. Got it. Locked class. The locked feature on the course is something that is normally reserved for cases when if you have a situation where you want to not allow any editing or changes in a course. And typically, if you have a business manager that goes through, does the refunds, deposits all the money, verifies that the course due and paid is equal, there are no outstanding bills, no outstanding expenses, then they lock that class. And it's just kind of a fail safe so nobody accidentally removes or changes data um, when they weren't supposed to. Again, it really helps. It's generally an audit, to, uh, an auditing lockdown to make sure no changes are being done. Uh, validated fields. We have lots of validated fields in the system. You see the little drop downs at a number of these fields. Um, that allows you to make sure your data is correct. And as you know, all fields that have a plus by them, and you do have to have a certain access level within your user levels at least a four, you can actually edit and add codes for those values in the dropdown. Hours, CEUs, and credits. Again, 
ACEWARE uses a salvation by grace approach, which is if you build the hours, credits, or CEUs on the class and a person enrolls in it, they will earn those credits uh, unless they screw up. And so that's kind of the Lori's note about take them away if they don't earn them. And there are a couple of ways that you can quickly remove credits uh, for those that don't make the class. And in fact, let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to quickly jump through the lookup on that. Looking up. Well, let's talk about the lookup. This is something we didn't have a slide for, Lori. But the new 8.0 search for names is also in courses which means as you start to enter numbers 2014, you begin to get only those classes that have 2014 in the routine. Now, if I were to go back and say, I want to look for 1414, now we've got a lot of different ones. 14F, we begin to narrow it down. ART, you begin to narrow it down and then you're at the course. The new search mode in the courses, and I'll get back to that. The beauty of it, you can search for a title now. If I wanted uh, fine arts, I can type in a couple of keywords and it'll actually search automatically off the top uh, in the course title for that particular category. I don't want fine arts, I want 14F. All right, student manager. Um, we're talking about editing so that when a student enrolls in the class, the hours and the CEUs will be automatically assigned to that student when they register. If they don't make the grade, so to speak, they don't attend, they, they, they only attend one, one week out of the four-week session, you can go in and edit that. Well, you can go in registration by registration, or if you go to student list, and again, if you're looking at the top and see the word editing, that means you can go into any one of the, the CEUs, the reg note, the credits, the grade, and the hours, and manually edit those. So if Jeff Brown only attended half the class, we're going to put 0.8 for him. And we're going to say only eight hours. And his grade was fail. And if Bob Dole didn't even go to the class, maybe he only attended one session. So we're going to give him just 0.4, I guess point, yeah, 0 0.4, 0 0.4 CEUs, and it would be four hours. And again, his grade definitely doesn't get a pass. So you can actually edit all of the CEUs, hours, grades, credit, right from uh, the roster view, which generally is a lot faster uh, than going one by one. Um, now, when you're done with this form, if you do Control F4, Control F4, watch the upper right part of my screen underneath your Go to Meeting. It should say X number of records updated, and then if we go into the registration records and find Mr. Dole, you'll see his hours were changed, his hours were changed, and he now is a fail, not rather than a pass. So again, I think for, for those of you that are doing uh, editing, that, that's a great speed up tool. All right, uh, subject code. Subject code is so important. And again, if you add it, it will, they will come. No, not quite. But anything you, when you put a subject code in the course screen, when a student enrolls in that class, it will be added to the student's interest code list. So again, this is probably one of the most important fields you can use for marketing programs and evaluating, doing your statistical analysis, evaluation of your programs. Calendar, putting a date. Uh, Matthew has a new date picker in 8.0. Uh, I think it works a lot better than the other one, not so much issues with some Microsoft stuff. Um, new feature in the system is called Gen RU. All right. The particular benefit of this would be you put in <clears throat> the number of hours the class meets. Let me go back to that. You put in the total hours the class meets, and typically this is for long programs, 400 hours, 600 hours, 900 hours. You put in the total clocked hours, 
clock hours indicate how many hours per day your class is going to meet, and then it will actually generate, um, I had a pop-up screen and it's not showing, it will then generate that it'll, it'll actually create the number of class sessions that you need to build out that class. So for 400, session, for 400 hours class that met four hours a day, it should give you 100 class sessions. And of course, it will recognize and bounce over your holiday calendar, uh, which we'll talk about in a bit. Room use. Uh, room use on the course screen allows you to manually edit or change individual room use, uh, individual sessions of a class. So again, going back to the course, uh, we have a class here that has four sessions. If we need to, and look at the note at the top, you may change the date, times, locations. So if you said, well, the second class, which is on the Wednesday the 3rd, happens to fall on my birthday. So I want to move it back to um, Tuesday of the week after the, 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 the 10th. So that would be, I'm just going to type in the new date. It would be the 16th, tab out. And then when I close it and come back, we now have Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Tuesday so that we basically move that back so that it's on. I actually edited the first day, the first day of the week. Uh, but basically, you can edit the, to the day. You can edit the start time. If we said, well, that one, we're going to do an evening class. So that's going to be, and now note, this is in military time. So if we said that's going to be 8 o'clock at night, which is 20 hundred hours to 2,200 hours, and now there's your time. It does give you your, your human time. And you can even change the location. We're going to move this to the Holiday Inn because we're going to party that night. So again, you can modify individual class sessions through the room use uh, routine. Control F4 to close. And then when you do save, uh, that updates your, your data in the system. All right, I wanted to kind of go through that. Grouping codes. Um, Grouping codes have two primary purposes. One is our ACE web. This determines the category that your class will appear when you're looking at your ACE web catalog groups or subject groups. It also is useful for certificate programs. And again, there is a webinar for that on certificate tracking, including the certificate report wizard. Um, if you are doing, uh, again, if you're a user now, present, future, or potential customer, and you are doing certificate tracking where a student has to take four out of 16 courses and earn a certificate if they've completed them successfully or earned so many hours, we have a wizard for that. So contact your tech, contact Aceware, and we will tell you all about that. Or go watch the webinar, certificate tracking, and you'll learn how to do that. Location information. Uh, again, the location is tied to a separate database of your locations. Uh, you can put in general information. You can put in special information on the web. Uh, put in notes about the location. Uh, the second page of this has a spot for additional information, um, which I'm going to actually get you to. And there's a benefit, Aceware Headquarters. So if I view the location, go to additional info. If you put in the address, city, state, and zip, uh, what you can do is actually get from Cheryl, get from our web people, a, a link that will allow you to uh, put this location on Google Maps from your ACEWeb. So your ACEWeb can actually pull up Google Maps, show the students the location of this particular class. Uh, the other thing about putting in the location, city, state, and zip is that that gives you, especially if you run classes at multiple locations, geographic locations, you can do statistical analysis based on the city, the state, even the zip code uh, to be able to do some analysis of your performance of classes. 
Okay, let's get back to where we were. All right, the location view, um, and again, um, all right, let's move on. I'm getting, okay, quick reports. Hopefully everybody who uses a course in Manager knows and loves quick reports, um, basically allowing you to run a battery of reports right from the course screen. And again, if you have the email module, then you are able to do email to class, quick list. One of the things that is new, it's been around, I should say, last several months, but a check special needs, and I don't know that I have in my demo one, but the idea is that if you have a student who might have marked that they have a special need, from the course quick reports, you can click special needs, and it'll bring up the student name, and it'll tell you whatever was put in the special needs as a top dog, which is just something in the routine. But it allows you to get a quick view <clears throat> of uh, a student's special needs status. All right. Uh, Lori, I've, I've been rolling right along here. Um, uh, questions? You're doing anything very well. We're going to hold our anything? questions. Yeah, right. we're going to hold our questions until the end because we've kind of passed some of the areas. But you're really good on time. I'm proud of you. Okay. All right. Well, we got to have time for the uh, the model of entering a, a virgin one from scratch. So, <clears throat> additional information UDS. This is the second screen. Uh, a lot of different options in here, kind of for special use purposes. Uh, alternate course code allows you to reference an alternate ID. Uh, actually, one of the things that can also be used for, and this is on the books for this coming year, is cross-linking your student manager courses, your courses in Aceware, to perhaps a campus database. I know in Montana, uh, in uh, Virginia, we've got a couple of those cases where we're trying to uh, integrate with PeopleSoft and, and Banner, uh, and that's a way for you to be able to tie the Banner ID of the class to the class in Aceware. Uh, registration times. Again, if you've got a certain registration time, probably mainly for workshop or conferences, you can put that in, reference that in your materials. Email attachments. If you are sending out attachments with email receipts, you can do that. People to notify who have a, people who, notif who want to be notified whenever a registration comes in. So if you've got an anal instructor or an anal coordinator, not that anybody does, or you are one of those, you can add your email to the BCC line and you'll automatically get a carbon copy blind of any registration in that class. All right, sponsoring firm, again, mainly for contract programs. You can actually link that to the firm's table. And then finally, membership requisites is where you can specify that you have to be a member to take the class. And this is of particular relevance for OSHER lifelong learning uh, folks, because typically OSHER classes are limited to members. In other words, you can't even get it. It's not like a discount. You cannot register for the class unless you are a member of the OSHER group. <clears throat> All right. I am going to stop right there, Lori, and see if, if this pique some interest because there are just a lot of different moving parts here and give me a chance to take a sip of water. Well, you go ahead and get a sip of water, but I think you have done an outstanding job of explaining because we don't have any questions. <laughs> All right. Well, Either that or they're really slow They're slow in. typists here. You guys need more coffee or Coke here after lunch. The next area underneath here, user-defined fields. Again, um, user, you can modify these. Um, use these for your own purposes. Um, and again, as you recall, there are user-defined fields on the name, the course, register, and, uh, well, actually firm and instructor. So multiple user-defined fields. General notes about UDS. Turning them on and off are user-specific. So every user, and I'm going to reiterate this because this is something that uh, people tend to struggle with sometimes. I'm going to edit my preferences. So this takes us to the preferences screen. The idea that turning fields on and off, I have the rights to edit my own criteria. So if I wanted to say my, my classes, none of my classes, I'm worried about hours or credit hours 
like Carnegie College Credit. So I can turn that off, and that field will be disabled on my screen. Anything in black is tied to the individual user, Chuck Havlicek or Lori Thompson or Joe Bo. Uh, blue items, and this is in the next part of it, is that they are global. So in other words, that's system level. And you have to be an administrator to change those. And again, everybody has to play by the same labels for or the same behavior for the blue items. Uh, data validation for character and number user-defined fields. There are some special mechanisms that you can use to validate data in uh, user-defined fields. We'll cover that in the codes webinar. And again, on the main course screen, you can display the contents of a course user-defined field or any other element on the course uh, from the main screen. And I'm actually going to get to that because that's kind of a cool element. Um, course UDFs. Now, I'm going to bring up a class using the F2 key, which I wanted to make sure we're going to cover later. But I wanted to bring up a class. So we're going to look at ACEWORK Conference. And we're going to look at, OK, Lori, I was at, where are we at? I'm, I'm losing my losing my thought here. Oh, UDF, of course UDF. OK, whew, thanks. I, I had uh, off the game there. This area between the enrolled and the button that's workshops or package is where you can actually display a user-defined view of some information that's somewhere related to this class. So from this particular window, you could reference something in the user-defined area. You can reference a registration fee. Uh, you could reference some other information that relates to this class. Well, how do you how do you do that? By going into the course UDF edit, there is the user display down here. Trim fees. This allows you to define, and you you may need your uh, your text help to kind of decide how you want that formatted. But this basically gives you the ability to custom define that kind of a view inside uh, the contents of your sub-tabs in the course. Lori, anything vestigial from the previous screen? So far, so good? So far, so good. Nothing for now. All right, main fees, fees. Lots of flexibility on fees. And, and again, we're not giving this as much detail as we probably need. Um, I, I'll wrench in again. There is good uh, review of this in the help guide. Main fees. You can have as many main fees as you want. Every fee must have a different, uh, each, you have to have different descriptions for different fees. Uh, you can hide them from the web. You can have an expiration date for, for that. They can be member-only fees. But a student only gets to pick one. Optional additional fees, you can have an unlimited number of other fees. And an individual can do some, none, all. And in the fee category, you've got the options, again, show on the web or not, member-only fees, automagic expiration of early bird, mandatory optional fees, discount fees. Again, the online help guide gives you a pretty thorough review of that. So we're going to move right along. Instructors. Um, adding an instructor to a course, the big plus button up here is where you go to get to the instructor list. Uh, completing the pay schedule area will generate faculty contracts. And again, in the, in the view of that, if we abandon, get a course up here. And so again, if you define your instructor, uh, the pay type, and you indicate the pay rate, uh, the system will do the math and come up with the total pay amount. Um, and the other thing, and I want to make sure to cover, as you are building instructors, we, we are not going to have time to probably create a complete instructor discussion here. But on the instructor record, and again, if you weren't paying attention, from the instructor screen of the course, you can click an edit instructor record, which will jump you to that instructor's detail. So here's my instructor info. Under additional info on instructor, 
you can define the default pay type that Chuck gets paid by, is per hour, and his default pay rate. Well, he's not done so well. We're going to knock down his salary to 47.50. And what that will do, any new course that you assign class Chuck as a new instructor, he will automatically be assigned a pay rate of hourly, no, a pay type of hourly and a pay rate of 47.50 for any subsequent courses he goes into. And of course, from here, you as a staff member can always edit if Normally, I get 4750 for professional programs, but if I'm also a, um, I, I, I do a geocaching or I do maybe vocational things, how to, how to play Frisbee golf, I don't get paid that much. I only get 20 bucks an hour. So you can edit that dollar amount down on a class-by-class -class basis, even though Chuck, the instructor, may have a default payment level. Final thing on this I want to cover, and I, people just don't use it, and you really should. There is a spot in the course where you can put in a rating of the instructor from the student evals. So if you can have, you define the labels, seven different uh, labels that you can set up, which is done in preferences, and then you can record the student evals. So maybe my content was 80. Materials was 70, and this is on a 100% scale. 95 interaction, 90 assignments was 50. Nobody likes homework. Facilities, eh, was so-so, 79. And overall would be, I don't have an averaging thing on that. It might be, say, 82. Uh, when, you, when you do that, and you can actually go to the instructor record, look at their history of courses taught, and be able to see what the evaluation rating was for that particular uh, student in the class, or that particular instructor in the classes that he's taught. <clears throat> now, I haven't saved that yet, so it's not in the record. But um, that is what the, um, the assignment, uh, the evaluation rating is. All right, back to our program. All right. Add as many instructors as you want. Everybody gets to have their own pay rate, so you can pay instructors at different rates for the same class. Um, and I will. I do want to go back one more time before we leave the instructor, and that is that if you want to add another instructor, and you're wanting to get um, Miss um, Obama here, uh, again I say uh, um, Miss Obama is going to teach a class. If their name is not in the lookup list, you hit Escape, and it actually will give you a blank instructor screen where you can actually create a new, a new instructor record, and uh, so that you can go ahead and fill out the data. You can put in data about the instructor, full-time, part-time, uh, put in any what their pay rate is going to be. Uh, gratis, she's teaching, she's volunteering her instruction. And now, once I've added her in the system, I can, I can add her into my, uh, into my payment group. So I said hourly, but then I said gratis for the amount, and so <clears throat> that um, brought in. Oh, I've got to click on Michelle. There we go, none, pay type none, amount none. Uh, so again, if you click on the instructor in the link, it'll change to the values for Chuck, click down below. This is Michelle, and she hasn't got her ratings back, so there's no numbers for her. All right, Lori, we good? We're good. You wanna, you wanna kick in? We good? No, I think we're very good. Thank you. All right, comments section. This is the next to the last window in the course. Um, several elements here. Number one, registration warning message, and again. Um, this is a hey, pay attention thing. So if you need to put in a uh, note that the uh, parking lot is tore up, parked behind the building, I-35 is busted, come from the north, uh, the instructor has changed, your new instructor is Fred Schwartz rather than Miss Obama, uh, anything you want to have popped up for both students who might be registering online and the staff, if a staff member is going to look up a registration for this class, anything in that pop-up message will pop up on the screen to warn them. 
reference document. Um, you can link to a document on the course. So again, if there was a syllabus that was a big, long PDF syllabus, if this was a contract class and you had um, a contract form that you wanted to have a reference to, you can reference that in the reference document area. Notes for the receipt, again, th these are notes that you can have on the confirmation receipt, whether it's on the email or the printed one. Uh, for the dance class, you'll say, please wear non-marking sole shoes with non-marking soles. For the construction class, you'll say, bring steel-toed shoes and a hard hat, whatever you want to do. Internal comments, uh, callback. There is a callback feature on the course that you can enter in a staff member and a reminder date, and then also put in the notes as to why you're sa they need to be reminded about something. And then finally, and I think we need to get back to that, uh, there is the email reminders to students, which allows you to enable the, this course to pop up when you go in to uh, log on to your system every morning to be reminded to send out reminder notes to students in upcoming classes. All right. Lori, how are we doing? We're doing very well. All right. Modules and built-ins. What else do we have in the system you might not like or want? And we'll talk in a bit. Two, the two main modules for the, for the back-end system is, number one is a package course module to allow you to bundle courses um, and BOGO support for the web. Uh, again, there is a webinar on that in the webinar archive. And then attendance tracking. Uh, if you're a tech school, if you're a vocational school, and you need to know every day who's in class and who is not on a day-by-day -day basis, then the attendance tracking tool will do that for you. And then for the few of you that don't have it, if you do not have AceWeb, uh, you're missing out on a one-time purchase for an employee who works 365 days for you. Does not take time off. <clears throat> Built-ins, again, budget builder, pocket ledger, uh, those are part of the base system. Uh, membership tracking, that's part of the base system. Workshop tracking. Um, I want to get back to the area here. And I want to real quickly, I think we've got a little bit of time. <clears throat> but again, the budget builder, uh, the big deal about the budget builder is that it allows you to generate a go, no, go, break even number on your program. So this allows you to um, you know, put in an estimated number of fees, put in an estimated per person pass through, put in expenses, how much you're going to spend on instruction, on marketing, and it'll go out and give you program a go no go and a break even number. <clears throat> again, very useful tool. Pocket Ledger again is a skunk work system primarily but it allows you to log expenses per individual class so that you can really do profit and loss analysis on a section by section, class by class basis. All right. Um, no, we don't want to do this. We want to abandon because that was not a good record. I think lock it, Roger. OK. Attendance. We've got the create attendance, record attendance. We've got modules for that. Um, all right, Aceware events, check the archives. And again, we've got most every module, we've got an archive, um, archive webinar on that. I think most of the webinar, most of the optional modules or the special built-in modules work the same pretty much between 8 and 7. <clears throat> so I don't think we're going to be reburning any of those, Lori. Helpful hips and hints, and again, Holidays, um, when you're building up courses, um, you need to make sure, and this is a note, before you start to build a terms classes, go into the holiday schedule. Make sure that you've got the current holidays in. So module, holidays, find holiday. <clears throat> make sure that you've got uh, all of the current year's holidays in place before you start building uh, before you start building your classes because if you build a holiday it will skip over those uh, days that you're not meeting it now 
one of the new things about holidays, I'm going to try this, Lori, cross your fingers, <laughs> is that you can, it worked, is that you can specify a date range. So if you were to go to Thanksgiving, where's Thanksgiving next year? Use the tool, T-H-A-N-K-S. So Thanksgiving 2014, ah, um, find T-H-A-N-K-S, hit the right button. Okay, so Thanksgiving is actually Thursday through Sunday. So you can actually set a date range. You don't have to create a, a Thursday calendar holiday, a Friday calendar holiday, a Saturday calendar holiday, a Sunday calendar holiday. You can put in a date range. So spring break, Christmas vacation. If you've got any multi-day vacation, maybe the 4th of July is on a Thursday this year and the, and the, and the university is giving you Friday off for good just because they're patriotic, you could put July 4 through July 5th and it will automatically cover that in your, um, in your holiday setup. That's new in, in 8.0. Uh, mass register. I don't know how many people do the mass register. I'm going to, okay, let's, let's make people wake up. Wake up, everybody. How many of you have ever used the mass register tool on a class? I would think we have, yeah, 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 yeah. Good. Good, good, good. Well, good. And, and again, the idea, the idea behind mass register is that if you have classes that might be sequenced, uh, level one, most everybody from level one goes to level two, uh, the mass register allows you to move an entire class and let you control, you can, you can, how you say, you can veto out, you can remove students from promotion. So everybody in the third grade gets to go to fourth grade except little Johnny who's just not cutting it. So he has to stay behind. But you can control the mass transfer of students, not the transfer, mass register of students from one class to the other. All right. Changing the sort order, navigating the system. The default sort order on a course is always course number. But temporarily, you can actually edit that and change it to some other order. Uh, begin date, course title, uh, I think canceled, not canceled. And the navigation is done. I'm going I'm to get brave here, Lori. The navigation is done through, now it is. It did it. I can't believe it. Um, there's a bug in the go to meeting. I screwed up. Let's see if I can get back. I'm back. Okay, getting nervous there. Um, but that you can. Um, okay, mass register. Let's get back. I'm back. I'm I'm together. I'm together. Sort order. Uh, how that works. So that when you're on when you're on a class. The default order when you're going left arrow, right arrow, is course number. So 101C, right arrow, 300, back arrow, 102C, 102B, 102A. You said, well, maybe I want to sort these by date. I just want to look at all the courses in this week of September. Well, click on sort, changes to begin date. And now if I go backwards, I go 929, 927, 924. I am looking at all the courses chronologically by date. So again, now when I leave and come back, it's going to reset to course number. There, you, you can't hard code or define that. All right. Uh, favorites, we've talked a little bit about the F2 and the F5, my shortcut keys. Um, these, again, are special tools. The beauty of the F2 key, for those of you that are working in manager, if you're working on a record, boss comes in and says, quick, Lori, how many classes do we have next week? Well, rather than closing the name, going into reports, running the report, you press F2, and you say seven days out, you hit the OK button, there are three classes meeting, and the enrollment, yada, 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 hit escape and you are right back where you were with the record you're working on, so you haven't missed a beat. That is the F2 key. The, all of the keyboard shortcuts are referenced for you under the keyboard shortcuts menu. 
So you've got enrollment report, which we just saw, the F5 person grabber, pay grabber, the dashboard, special tools. Again, they're listed in F1, and they are all on the help guide. Um, again, we're going to enter a course from scratch. Yeah, I'm not sure we're going to have time to do a full uh, native entry of one, Lori. Um, but um, generally, if you've got a class where you're doing another section, um, again, rather than starting with add and just doing all fill in the blank from the get-go, you would do clone the course. <clears throat> and that allows you to take all of the old data from the original section, removes the dates so they're blank, puts it, you put a new course code, and you have to manually do the new course code, fill in the missing data, uh, missing dates, edit any data that needs to be changed, hit save, and you have a new section. Very speedy. And again, you'll get a little pop-up for the course code, uh, put in the new course code, Actually, voila, you have to, oh, option questions. Yeah, the date. Put in the date. The date is cleared. And edit anything that needs to, and you're good to go. Uh, math clone. There is a math clone tool. We'll cover these in a sec. Uh, allows you to do, if you really have almost a carbon copy set of classes from one term to the other, and they all start kind of on the same time, almost like a uh, high school or academic uh, kind of model, uh, the math clone tool is out there. Email class reminder. Again, uh, under the preferences inside of course, you have to turn that on. So if you're saying, well, I've never seen that email course reminder before, you have to go into course preferences. And I'm gonna, this, is, this is one. So we go into preferences, we go into the course, you have to turn on the email reminders and then tell it how many days before the class starts do I want to start to see the reminder note. Generally, you're probably, you know, vacation and notwithstanding, you're looking at a three to five day reminder note because you don't want to send it to them too far in advance. They'll forget it again. So, um, act and again, on an individual class, um, you can check the box. That, again, is a preference. You can set up a preference on the course screen under your preferences to automatically check the email reminder on any new class that you create. So there is a preference to, to automatically check that. OK, let me get back. I didn't really mean to hit the slideshow. And more. There's more uh, under Tools. We've got a variety of elements in the system now <clears throat> that you can use to help with the courses. Um, there is under uh, data cleanup, uh, there is an element in here called course code transmogrification. OK, and for people who have inherited systems, for people who have used ACEWARE for a long, long time, Maybe you want to change the way you build your course codes. Well, the course code transmogrification basis allows you to modify the format of the course code and do that automatically for a whole batch of classes at one time. Now, again, if you need to do course code transmogrification, two tips. Number one, make a backup. And number two, I really would recommend talking to your tech, your ACEWARE tech, before you uh, jump in. It's just kind of one of those, like brain surgery, uh, we're a little careful about doing it yourself unless you've been through this a uh, time or two before and are more familiar with it. Um, so uh, some tools on the data cleanup. Uh, under course module, you've got, again, the mass update. There is a mass delete option, uh, cancel course tool a mass registration transfer. Now, we told you in the, in the slideshow about mass register of uh, all the students in class A, you're going to mass register them into a class B. Mass transfer allows you to transfer all of the students from one section of a class into a different one. Where would this be useful? 
if you are having to cancel a class, uh, maybe you've got five golf sections. Well, you've got one class with only three. Well, you're going to cancel that section and automatically transfer all three of those registrations into a new section. So again, yeah, it, it removes the it removes the old uh, class registration from the old class and just transfers them in a batch, if you would, to a new class. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to ask right before we get into Q and A, Lori, how many of you have used the mass transfer tool? Uh, Gail, Hands you would up. be my yes, ma'am. Hands are going up. That's good. Oh, good. Good, good, good. All right, so we've got a, a, a few in there. Anyway, I, that I think is a handy tool. So, All right, I believe we are just about done with my formal part. Again, the online help guide. Uh, remember, that is your friend, great resource. Uh, so, Lori, we are at a full almost hour, lots of material. Let's get some questions. Oh, we've got tons of questions. Okay, let's see. Uh, favorite reports, are those set oh. up by user or organization? I believe that is by user. I, well, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me show you real quick on that. Uh, okay, there's my four favorite reports. I'm going to log out and log back in. Oh, uh, hang on. We'll see. While you're getting another question, bring another question up while I'm doing that. Okay. Can you still search for classes by date? Yes. Um, uh, yes, you can. Uh, I'm I'm in now as Mr. Ace, and the answer is it's private. So every different user can have their own set of reports. That is pretty flipping cool, kids. Uh, dates. Yeah. If we're looking up a course, and I'm looking up uh, uh, 2014, I'm not sure 2014. Uh, I'm going to have to check with Matthew. Oh, he is five. He's listening for you, by the way. Oh, one, two. Matthew, how does a course, how does a begin date work search in, in here? Now, what I, you can. I, what, I haven't done it in a while, so I don't remember. <laughs> okay. But you think there's support 10, 14, 2014? Try, try 10, without the slashes. 10, 14. 2014, no. 14, 10 slash 14, 1, 14 slash, yeah, there it is, there it is, yeah, so you enter it actually in a normal sense, you'd enter month, month, day, day, slash, year, year, uh, so there's 10, 14, 14, let's, let's go back. Uh, 9214. So if you say 09, oops, 09, 09 slash 02, well, there it is. There's a first class that meets uh, on the second of, uh, of um, so yes, but uh, it's, it, you don't have to do the Kansas bass backwards approach. All right, Lori. Thanks, Matt. Okay. Uh, your, your more experienced users are reminding you that you could tab into the date field, but that's no longer needed. So I think we ought to Help right, help and, and I guess the idea in the old system, for instance, in the old system, if you wanted to search by title, you had to tab into the title. You don't have to now. So if I wanted extend student manager, I just start typing extend. There it is. I automatically check the uh, title. Now I'm going to also say that if I wanted to do student manager, student, I can spell it right. Um, I believe the default sort on this is by begin date, but if we wanted to click on the column header, you can flip the order, right? So now we are in inverse, does it, inverse order? The, yeah, it is, there it is. The default so, order was course number. Okay, default order was course number. When I'm looking at all of the classes with the word student in the title, and I go over to begin date, I can sort it uh, by date. There is low to high, high to low, um, and again, I can do it based on enrollment. High to low, low to high, or vice versa. So that you've got the ability to actually click on the column heading and be able to, um, uh, to, be able to get into that. So, all right, good question. 
Yes, they are. Uh, and, and I think Matthew might want to take this one, Chuck, so I'm, I'm going to let him uh, fire away. grab this one. Changing the room use date, does it also change the attendance dates? What's the story, uh -huh. what's the relationship between room use and attendance? I, yes, it will tr attempt to to make that change in uh, the attendance date. Uh, sometimes it doesn't quite work because the matching there there isn't a direct link between the uh, the attendance and the room use table. So it it uh, there's a few cases where that doesn't exactly work as well as I would like it to, but it does attempt to do it. All right. Well, we, we give it a fighting shot. So, again, for those of you that do attendance, would also have the hour-based classes. Uh, this is again uh, a way to get your room use, uh, your your schedule put together without having to decide how many sessions you had to have. You almost had to uh, figure out on a sheet of scratch paper the sessions before you use the uh, building out the class. So. Uh, Lori, questions? We're running a bit over here. Yep. Can we add more than one UDF on the course main tab? No. Well, no. There is only one UDF field, and you're limited to the amount of space that you've got here. Now, if you have two data values in a UDF, maybe you two numbers, and you just put pound one, pound two in the number, uh, whatever fits in, what, 30 characters you can put in there. Uh, but that's the only field right now in the course that gives you a view of stuff that is, whoa, that, of stuff that is inside the box here. So okay. it's, just, it's just real estate. There's just only so much real estate left and right to work with. Okay. And your more experienced users asking again, did they hear you say that the reg warning could be printed on the student confirmation? Or is that simply a pop-up for the staff? Oh, no. You can modify the student confirmation to include that. I mean, that, uh, that, that's always been a possibility. You can add that, too. And I need Cheryl to help me on the email one. But for the print one, absolutely. If you wanted to put that on the printed receipt, um, you can add that. It, just use the report template to do that. I'd have to check on the email. I'm not sure whether that's one on there or not. Matthew, do you know? I, I think it would be. I see no reason why you couldn't do it. So I don't think it's probably in very many templates by default. You'd probably have to. Oh, I'm, it's an probably ad not course. in very many. You'd probably have to get. We'd have to get with Cheryl to get the the verbiage to add that. But yeah, I would think you could. Okay, um, Connie wants to know if when she's cloning a course, does the account number on the instructor uh, screen carry over, even if it's different from the account number on the main screen? Boy, I don't know, and I think we'd have to test that <clears throat> if you're doing a different number in here than what's on the main screen. I, I'm pretty sure the main screen would carry over. Matthew, we'd have to test that. Uh, we'll have to test that and let you know, Connie. Okay. And can you add reports to the quick reports area? Uh, yes. Now, uh, I'm logged in as, as um, so-and-so. These are yours, so you are who you are. I can go in, you can go in and put into their default report, uh, course between two dates, save, and add a report. If you have the rights to this area, which I think is, what is this, Matthew? Anybody who can see reports, level three, would be able to do this? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So yes, you can add your own, absolutely. You're not stuck with what your coordinator or your tech gives you. OK. And I think that's about it. There were a ton of questions, and I answered a ton. Well, of good. Be overwhelmed good. at the end. So well, I'm again, next Wednesday, next Wednesday, same time, same place. We're glad to have you. We're always online. Um, come back and see us next week, and tell your friends. So. We'll look forward to seeing you next week. Lori, good job. Matthew, thanks for backing up. Uh, we'll see you guys next Wednesday. Bye-bye, everybody.